to uh, City Council meeting uh, for July the 15th. Um, we will uh, have a prayer by Councilman Sean Schulte, uh, followed by Pledge of Allegiance before we come to order. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and the honor of being to serve the citizens of this great city. Father, as we make our way through the agenda tonight, we pray uh, for your wisdom. Father, we pray that uh, we would hear the topics with clarity and that we would make decisions that would benefit the citizens. Father, uh, we lift up to you the men and women who serve in our fire and police departments. Uh, they put their they put themselves in harm's way each day and we thank you father we lift up their families and we pray that you would provide an extra measure of blessings upon them father it uh, we pray that everything that we do and say may bring glory and honor to your name in Jesus name amen We'll call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Branch. Here. Bray. Here. Carol. Here. Graham. Here. Henry. Hussey. Here. Mihalovic. Here. Prather. Here. Schulte. Here. Scrivener. Here. Okay, that we have a quorum. Um, item, uh, agenda item number five is uh, miscellaneous agenda item and we have the introduction of new police officers tonight uh, chief schrader three newly employed police officers um, i would like each to stand as uh, i read their name uh, first is alan bruce alan graduated from helias high school now it's catholic high school uh, attended Columbia College, previously operated a small business in town. Um, he, w or he has begun uh, his academy training at the Missouri State Highway Patrol headquarters here in Jefferson City, and he began that training on June 3rd. Second is Jeremy Kaufman. Jeremy attended the University of Missouri and Columbia College. He's currently a member of the Army National Guard. He graduated from the Law Enforcement Training Institute uh, at the University of Missouri in December of 2012. Uh, he was previously employed as an officer for the University of Missouri Police Department, and he is obviously post-licensed in the state of Missouri. Next is Cody Schuler. Cody graduated from Helias Catholic High School, attended Lynn Tech, um, and graduated from the Law Enforcement Training Institute at the University of Missouri in August of 2011. So he is post-certified in the state of Missouri. He was previously employed with the Lincoln University Police Department. So we welcome them. Thank you, Chief. Gentlemen, welcome to uh, one of the finest police departments in the state that protects one of the finest communities in the state. And uh, we're, we're very pleased that you made the decision to join the police force and welcome. Uh, certainly, I wanted to echo the words of Councilman Scrivener and say congratulations uh, and looking forward to working with uh, all three of you. Uh, special uh, recognition to Officer Schuler, who worked over at Lincoln University uh, Police Department. Uh, the students will miss you. I know that Chief Nelson would miss you, uh, but I do know that the city is getting a great person uh, in, in Officer Schuler, I'm sure, and the other two as well. So I just want to say thank you for your time served at Lincoln University. Any other comments? Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, I think we we kind of make it known that we appreciate you being here, but you're under no obligation to stay. If uh, if you'd like to uh, stay for the rest of the meeting, certainly you're welcome. But if you want to uh, leave and join your family or whatever you might have planned for the, this evening, you're certainly welcome to do that too. So, thank you again for being here. Um, Next item on the agenda is item number six, public hearings. Uh, 
Would the clerk please read? Um, Two thousand thirteen thirty four, an ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, changing, amending, and modifying the zoning map of the zoning code of the city of Jefferson by rezoning nine point one one acres from C one neighborhood commercial to PUD planned unit development for land addressed as thirty six twenty five Missouri Boulevard, described as part of the southeast quarter of the northwest quarter of section nine, township forty four north. Range 12 West, Jefferson City, Cole County, Missouri. And would you go ahead and read the associated bill as well? Bill 2013-35, an ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, approving a preliminary PUD plan for property located at 3625 Missouri Boulevard, described as part of the southeast quarter of the northwest quarter of Section 9, Township 44 North, Range 12 West, Jefferson City, Cole County, Missouri. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ms. McMillan, would you please uh, give us a description of? Thank you, Mr. President. The uh, Planning and Zoning Commission reviewed the rezoning and the PUD plan at their meeting on June 13th. The land use that is proposed for this property, uh, which is addressed 3625 Missouri Boulevard, is an automobile dealer and specific automotive uses that are proposed in the plan. And that consists of a dealership building. The dealership building is uh, 35,909 square feet. It includes a full service department and a detail shop containing 4,250 square feet. You'll notice on the map here that uh, the property uh, currently has an area that's zoned PUD. Uh, surrounded by a, a larger area that's currently zoned C1 Neighborhood Commercial. The uh, bill to rezone would rezone the remaining uh, C1 area to planned unit development PUD. So the entirety of the property would be zoned PUD and subject to the plan that's before you under Bill 35. Okay. Are there any questions for Ms. McMillan? Seeing none, uh, we're going to open, open a public hearing on this matter. Uh, the hearing is open. Is there anyone here to speak for this rezoning? <laughs> Would you please state your name and address for the record? Uh, Drew Corwin, 3215 Missouri Boulevard. Um, I'm here to represent the Corwin Automotive Group. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to our company tonight, and um, a little bit later I'm going to introduce Mike Bates from CMPS to do some specifics, and if, if needed, Carrie Gamper from Architects Alliance. The Corwin Automotive Group was founded um, by my great-great-grandfather in 1914. We currently operate stores in North Dakota, Montana and Missouri. We've been in Missouri since the fall of 2010 when we purchased the Honda and Hyundai store. One year later in the fall of 11 we purchased the Nissan store and moved it into the existing Hyundai store. So really right now we're operating three dealerships in two locations. Um, if any of you have ever been to either one of the locations, space is a major major concern. Um, this brought us to the decision to move or to propose to move our Honda store to the Hobbs location. When we do that, we would like to move our Nissan store into the old Honda facility and leave Hyundai in its current location right now. That way we have three separate facilities for the three separate franchises. Uh, we currently have 150 employees uh, working right now in the two locations. With the addition of the new facility and separating into three locations, we estimate we're going to add about 50 employees to our total headcount. I think uh, if you guys look at your packets, you'll be pleased with the state-of-the-art facility, the landscaping, and the overall development plans that uh, we've submitted. Um, tonight, I'm here to answer any questions or concerns that you guys may have regarding the development. And like I said earlier, if I can answer them, Mike Bates or Carrie Gamfer would be able to maybe get into more of the specifics for it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Corwin? Ms. Carroll. Thank you for being here tonight, and uh, it looks like it is going to be a nice development. And I've had a few questions that have come up from the neighbors, and I'm sure some have already been addressed, but I wanted to also get them out uh, at this hearing. Um, for example, one of them is um, delivery trucks that would be bringing the cars in, and I believe you'd mentioned that probably wouldn't be done before 9 a.m. at a maybe a previous meeting with the neighbors but I know it was a concern that sometimes that can happen as early as 7:30. so I don't know if that would what kind of impact delivery trucks would have but that was something that that was brought to my attention okay do you want me to, you want to do each one individually or? I'm sure you can address that. okay and um, maybe Brian for on the delivery truck issue um, the and you can kind of correct me if I'm wrong or not saying something um, the, ma the main gate is how, how wide Would, would, you say, would you say your name and address for the record, please? Um, Brian McMillan with Central Missouri Professional Services, 2500 East McCarty Street, and I'm the engineer on the project. But uh, basically, the the, pro the site's designed to accept delivery trucks from Missouri Boulevard. There's an existing entrance at Missouri Boulevard now that that will be the main entrance to the uh, to the site, and it's a I believe a 32 foot wide uh, driveway. It's almost wider than a lot of city streets are. Uh, and uh, the delivery trucks is designed to go in through the side. You can kind of see a dashed line going around the side. They can, they'll come in, go around the building, and can unload uh, out in front or on the side over here, and then go on the way around the building and out back out to Missouri Boulevard. So that's the that's the plan for delivery trucks. So we've, we've eliminated uh, trucks unloading on Missouri Boulevard as far as this site. Right. They they had the ability to definitely do it on site. Great, thank you. Because I know that's been a then, concern Karen. with the um, the traffic in that area and also the the timing. A um, couple other things that came up that you may also be able to address, but things such as uh, the hours of operation beyond the showroom hours, and I'm not sure uh, pertaining to the zoning. It may be something Janice from city staff would be able to answer just to make sure they are within um, the zoning. What would be allowed as far as uh, if there would be any kind of nighttime activity or activity, let's say within the uh, repair shop, and also lighting, and I know they had there were some neighborhood concerns about let's say how some dealerships maybe have big balloons and, and big signage or for events and different things, but mainly I think their concern is what would be visible to the neighbors or what might have an impact on the neighbors. And so far, it seems like the delivery truck shouldn't have an impact, but things such as lighting and uh, intercom systems if those would have any kind of impact on the the uh, neighbors okay um, our hours of operation would be 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday and Friday and Saturdays from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. Um, from a signage standpoint we are going to have the uh, Honda podium sign which is currently in front of the existing Honda store right now and uh, we have met with the neighborhood a couple of different times and we've agreed uh, to not put any signage on Hobbs Road. So really I think the only sign would be the, the podium sign in front, of, in front of the dealership on Missouri Boulevard. Great, thank you. Um, and I think my last question mainly is pertaining to the buffer. I know there's been some concern about some removal of the natural buffer and it sounds like you have a good buffer in place, but I wondered if you could just mention um, the buffer against the the neighborhood there sure uh, this this drawing here is a good uh, good one to look at in regards to the buffer my pointer will work I'll kind of uh, this solid green shading here uh, that's what we show as our uh, it's kind of a um, an evergreen buffer and basically we're planting evergreen trees every uh, 12 feet but they're staggered so there's one every six feet uh, so you basically have two trees for every 12 feet and uh, I think uh, we have them at six feet tall to be planted at this time uh, and that would extend basically from the entrance at Hobbs Road all the way around the site and it would be up at the sidewalk elevation here because Hobbs Road is higher than the site so we're wanting to put it up there to to uh, it provide more of a buffer than being down here on the side at the bottom 
because uh, you'd just be looking at the tops of the trees. And then it would come around here, and at this point, it, it comes up to the back of curb of the uh, parking lot. And the reason we do that is most of this parking lot is above the houses down here and, and condominiums. So by putting it up there, it creates a, a better buffer because you're looking up and those trees are going to be planted at the top of the slope and down onto the slope. So, so that is the planted buffer that we plan to do. This, this shaded, this other lighter green here is the uh, natural buffer that we plan to leave in place. Uh, we're trying to leave as much as we can. We've even uh, put a, a large retaining wall in here to, uh, to save more of the, of the natural buffer area. And we've uh, we actually modified it a little bit to, to help provide more of a buffer around this uh, condominium building, which is built about 25 feet from the property line. So that's, uh, and, uh, and also with the buffer, uh, this building here actually acts as a buffer and with a, with a fence along this side uh, to help buffer this area over here, which is uh, kind of a sensitive area that we want to keep uh, out of the public view. So, any other questions? Okay, thank you. You, you had asked about lighting, too. Lighting and intercom. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, the, the intercom, uh, we actually have a drawing. Uh, if you could go to that, it's uh, who has the one, right this one here. This is the, uh, the proposed building, and I've kind of got these red squiggly lines here. This is Missouri Boulevard out here, Hobbs Road. Uh, we proposed three intercoms, or speakers, out on the site, and all three speakers will be directed towards Missouri Boulevard. And um, we, don't pr we don't propose any speakers around the side of the building, around the back of the building. The, uh, and these, the primary use of these speakers are for people that are there getting their car serviced. Uh, you know, they can let them know, hey, your, uh, your car's ready to be picked up. So uh, we just want to have it that, you know, a lot of times people will look around the, the site at, at vehicles uh, while they're waiting on their car to be serviced. So it's basically for that. Uh, they've basically discussed that uh, the, the, the salesman, if they're trying to get a hold of them, if they have a phone call, that they're going to use cell phones for that. So, so the speaker use would be to a minimum. And as far as lighting, um, you know, we, d we don't have a detailed lighting plan at this time, but it, but it will be done in accordance with city code. And the plan is the, to use uh, uh, lighting with full cutoff that would, is basically all directed down and, and most of it stays on the site. As a matter of fact, the code requires zero light going on to the neighboring properties. So, um, and I think we're, and, and it's also been discussed, we're going to use uh, at nighttime, the lights will be cut down to 50% or less, where it's just security lighting in the evenings. So, so after business hours, the, the lighting's just cut down enough for security. Thank you. Yep. Are there any? Yes, sir, Mr. Gray. Uh, thank you. Uh, I do have a couple of questions um, in regards to the, deli the delivery trucks. What time will the delivery trucks be delivering to your business? Uh, the delivery trucks usually deliver during normal business hours occasionally. Uh, there will be a truck that'll show up, you know, an hour or two before uh, we open, um, and we kind of have a drop-off location for them. Okay. And along those same lines, will the delivery truck be able to turn into your dealership? And is there a turn that they can make that they can come back out the same way, yep. or they exit off onto Hobbs Road and then exit onto Missouri Boulevard? Uh, they'll come in through the main entrance on Missouri Boulevard, and they can actually go around the building and then exit the, the main entrance that they came out of. So there shouldn't be any exiting off onto Hobbs no. Road? No. Okay. And I guess my last question is probably for staff, but um, I think uh, Councilman Scrivener, you had mentioned about uh, having a conversation with MoDOT uh, in regards to uh, that traffic study that was done and the traffic that was on Missouri Boulevard. Uh, and for the past week, I have driven uh, that area uh, between the hours of 1130 and 1230. And I can say that that is a concern, you know, because there, there's a lot of traffic trying to, especially trying to turn onto, onto 50. And I do know that, you know, with, with trucks uh, trying to turn to the dealership with traffic backed up, they might start to become an issue. So I don't know if that would be staff or whoever, but someone needs to, I guess, continue the talks with, with the state as it relates to uh, that, that traffic area concern. So. 
uh, Councilman, I think my comment was that the uh, MoDOT, uh, individual from MoDOT indicated that there would be minimal additional traffic. That he acknowledged that traffic is an issue out there and that they are currently studying what to do about it and that it is uh, th that there is an issue but uh, his indication was as far as compounding the traffic issues uh, that they didn't believe that there would be a significant impact uh, partially because of the business hours not really being uh, coincidental with uh, commuting hours uh, but and, and that's where most of the problem, not that there isn't problem uh, throughout the day, but most of their really significant problem are during co commuting hours. And so that, he, he wasn't trying to say that there would be no impact, he was just saying that they expected it to be minimal impact from the dealership. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak for the proposal? Please Mayor Mike Bates, Central Missouri Professional Services, 2500 East McCarty Street. Uh, good questions and good answers initially. Uh, part of the reference has been to the visuals that we provided tonight because with the paperless process it's still nice to have a visual that you can actually look at and see what we're doing so I'll run through those real quickly because there are additional ones the first one which you looked at shows the buffering the site layout the blue indicates the building the second is actually the overall site plan without the aerial photography it actually has red arrows that indicate the the whole design for the site has been looked at to minimize what we perceive to be the impact on the neighborhood. And basically that encourages traffic. The three red arrows outside the building are the access to the service area where you would check in. Then everything that the only garage doors we have on for access are essentially on the front of the building and then an exit on each end of the building. So it's the idea being to contain the activity. It basically is all inside. Of course, the detail shop is only for Corwin serviced vehicles, so that doesn't generate additional traffic. So the second sheet is that. The third sheet is actually the landscape plan. The fourth sheet is a description of the, um, the speaker system. The next sheet is actually a perspective of the building and a little bit of a view of the overall site. And then the fourth sheet is a larger detail of the site plan and elevations of the building. And then additional information that, that was used in developing and working with the neighborhood. And I'll touch just a little bit on the history of this, this project or this uh, process. In 2005, a plan was brought forward to create a development on the 11 plus acres that included financial institution, retail, uh, condos, uh, and a restaurant. And at that time, in regard to that, we, can, we had prepared a traffic impact study that actually required certain improvements to the highway for accessibility. Based on that traffic study and the proposed use of the site, that plan was implemented as far as construction of the improvements. Subsequently, that didn't happen. And then I think in 2008, an idea was proposed for a hotel, a restaurant. Traffic study was revisited. That was developer driven, and it didn't happen. Where we are tonight is a small portion of the property is zoned PUD. The rest of it is zoned C1. The reason we think this is such a good opportunity is it's basically one and done. When we started the process, we met early on, and I think that was in April with the uh, city staff and said the only potential for this project is to prepare a good PUD plan that would assure and guarantee the neighborhood of what is to be built. We've done that. There were meetings, several meetings with the neighborhood. We uh, started that process on April 4th. About 40 of the neighbor uh, residents attended. On May 2nd, a meeting was held at Architects Alliance with a small committee trying to look at additional details for the site. And then we had a subsequent meeting in the neighborhood. And at that time, we had actually staked the building corners, the parking lot, the property line, which some were surprised that it's as close to the residents. As, as it is so with that and then subsequent to that city staff hosted a neighborhood meeting at City Hall to 
to go over the process and make sure everybody was understanding the the issues and we're going to have those issues with whatever with any development on this site but we think the win-win situation is here is the nature of developing the site with one owner one use and that doesn't change without coming back through the legislative process buffers have been created that far exceed the city's standard minimum standards uh, right now we're estimating over 140 trees planted just for the perimeter buffer um, landscape buffer a, a versa lock type modular block retaining wall is planned that was done because the fill slopes in that area where the existing drainage is would get close to the property lines and we didn't think the neighborhood would want to look at a fill slope without having a re, uh, the re block retaining wall there and then the uh, landscaper buffer on top of it in addition to that it maintains the natural buffer storm rotter as we met with the neighborhood we found that there is an actual existing stormwater problem between the two condo buildings we are actually capturing the storm water from the improved portion of the site and routing it around to the east in a more direct route to the city's detention basin from a traffic standpoint um, from our perspective we're fortunate we know that in particular um, Councilman Graham mentioned that he's been driving at noon. I think when you talk to MoDOT, their biggest concern is the evening or p.m. peak traffic, which stacks from the interchange. Uh, Trent Brooks, the district traffic engineer, has been receptive to working with us, and they've indicated that they're going to take a serious look at the signal timing for those peak hour issues. In regard to the 2005 traffic study, the traffic study that we did subsequent to that for the Corwin development generates approximately 30 percent of what was anticipated with the original plan in 2005 so this is from our perspective about as little impact as you can have on this site as as you can find as we met with the neighborhood you'll see that there is one drive access off of Hobbs as uh, Drew and Brian said it's not signed uh, we think that's a public safety issue and that that lack of connectivity would be a disadvantage to the neighborhood in the future uh, there were two drives shown on the original plan we eliminated one of those and just as the hotel site plan required it, we moved it as close to the Learfield communications property as possible it's a little bit of discussion by about the lighting uh, display vehicle lighting is different from your typical commercial type lighting I think they've got a, done a good job of that but what they what they also should have said is that the area where the cars park adjacent to Hobbs which by the way is below the street level is far reduced from the display lighting during business hours and then as they said energy wise those are going to be cut to 50 percent at night the site was designed with the building being pushed back because of the activity in front of the building it's hard to see on the site plan but there are actually gates alongside the building and a fence extending from the west side of the building to the Hobbs Road area that prohibits the public's access during off duty or night hours matter of security so with that I've, I've covered a lot of territory um, we truly believe this this the development of this site is always going to be difficult the C1 zoning for most of it and if we could go back to the to the uh, first slide the C1 zoning allows for many uses that I know these folks really would not be interested in and what I think is good is what we would typically see from a truly uh, return on investment uh, developer is that right now you could have at least one if not two lights lots running on Hobbs Road having access there having signage C1 allows for drive-throughs this takes all of that out of play now granted I understand we've got a natural area there and development infield develop development's always going to be sensitive but I'll tell you when you look at the potential of this site one and done and the limited impact this type of use has it's to us it's a win-win situation and we're fixing some in infrastructure problems along the way so with that I know I've covered a lot of area quickly be happy to answer any questions and I hope I haven't added confusion to Drew and Brian's testimony uh, thank you mr. Bates uh, the uh, a point that you made that I think is is worth noting is that there have been two previous 
attempts to develop that property and both of them would have been probably more intrusive and as you said uh, created uh, what 70 percent more traffic or if yes uh, and uh, and that's just the nature of the don't I, and folks i'd always rather be lucky than good but in this situation we are truly are from our perspective lucky that the nature of the development is something we can control and i want to tell you the um we've dealt with some of these screening buffers before uh 146 foot ball and burlap trees planted, planted, planted on your per perimeter that are in excess of the city's landscaping ordinance is a significant commitment. And I, I think the Corwin family is trying to find a plan that's workable. Are there questions for Mr. Bates? Thank you, Mr. Bates. Thank you. Is, is there anyone else here to speak for uh, this project? Is there anyone here to speak against this project? Seeing no uh, none, uh, we will bring the hearing to close. Is there any debate by council? Ms. Carroll. Um, I think one thing I want to mention, I, I think overall there's been a lot of efforts made on all sides, and I appreciate that. Um, the traffic issue that perhaps uh, we could maybe put that on a future traffic and transportation agenda, just simply the information that they're gathering from MoDOT, because I know that's in the works. Um, I know the uh, we are relying on some outdated traffic studies, but the discussions and um, have been started with MoDOT, and they are, I believe, working on maybe some signal timing. If that's, I believe that's what I understand. Janice might be able to elaborate. But could we? Uh, I guess I just don't want to move forward tonight and then forget that we still kind of need a little bit of follow up on that. And I think the place to do it would be traffic and transportation. So perhaps we can add that to a future agenda and. I guess Janice would be the one on staff to communicate with them so we make sure we get our end of the information. Thank you. Ms. McMillan? Well, um, I'd suggest we refer that to the Public Works and Planning Committee because uh, um, this is a MoDOT controlled area. So um, any agreements would probably be between the City Council and MoDOT. Okay. Right. Uh, but I would like to point out that uh, the problem that, that's been mentioned by the neighborhood as far as traffic goes is it, it, it's a problem that exists today uh, and the problem is the inability or a difficulty in making left turns from Hobbs Road onto Missouri Boulevard at certain times of the day and that's because of the traffic that the Missouri Boulevard arterial is, is carrying um, the traffic that's going to be generated by this proposed development is quite small in comparison to the type of development that could locate on this 11 acres. Thank you. Uh, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, and you're right. I think this is something we can look at almost separate from this that we're voting on tonight. It's almost something that uh, even if nothing happened here or if something different happened here, we'd still want to kind of review the, the timing and on those lights. So I think Public Works would be fine with me whenever that future information becomes available. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Any questions on this side? If there are no questions, then are we ready to vote on uh, Bill 2013-34? And we've already read it. Yes. So uh, we will have roll call, please. Branch? Aye. Bray? Aye. Carroll? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Mihalovich? Aye. Prather? Aye. Schulte? Aye. Scrivener? Aye. Okay, it passes. And we have a related bill, 2013 which uh, has to do with the uh, PUD plan. And we've already read that. Is there any debate? Seeing none, roll call, please. Bray? Aye. Carroll? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Mihalovich? Aye. Prather? Aye. Schulte? Aye. Scrivener? Aye. Branch? Aye. Okay, that bill passes. Next item on the agenda is uh, minutes and reports received and filed. We have received the Public Works and Planning Committee January 24th, February 21st, March 21st, and May 22nd, 2013 minutes. Uh, Cultural Arts Commission May 22nd, 2013. Parks and Recreation Commission June 11, 2013. Item 8, Council Committee Reports. Uh, Councilman 
Carroll, Administration Committee, please. Thank you. The Administration Committee met July 10th, and we discussed the sidewalk cafe permits. It was brought back to that committee after, at the request of some um, restaurants that had some questions about the insurance requirements, but I believe everything has been taken care of, so that will appear on a future council agenda. We also discussed the JCTV metrics. We had some representatives from JCTV. We had Gloria Enlow, who's here this evening, and also representatives from uh, Lincoln University there to uh, come up with a plan to work together. So they are going to take the suggestions back, come up with something that's workable on their end, and present it to us at a future administration meeting. And then at that point, we'll bring it forward to the council. So the good thing is it's a collaborative effort between all the parties involved. Uh, the next meeting will be Wednesday, August 7th at 8 a.m. across the hall. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we'll have the Finance Committee, uh, Councilman Schulte. Thank you, Mr. President. The Finance Committee has not met since the last council meeting. Our next meeting is Tuesday, July 23rd, 7.30 a.m. across the hall. Uh, and I will defer the report on the financial um, status to the city administrator under item 10. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next would be the Public Safety Committee uh, chaired by Councilman Prather. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the uh, Public Safety Committee has not met since uh, the last uh, council meeting, and our next meeting will be across the hall Thursday, August 1st, after the Brown Bagel. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, Next would be the Public Works and Planning Committee, and I chair that committee. Um, hmm. I'm trying to use my phone here for my agenda, and there's something blocking. <laughs> uh, I will tell you this, our next meeting is uh, Thursday, July the 18th. Uh, that would be this Thursday. You know what's causing that? Here, let's try that. There we go. All right. New phone and all. Uh, <laughs> We will, uh, under old business, we will discuss Jefferson City Hangar Association ground lease renewal, uh, Chestnut parking and traffic issues at Lincoln University, uh, developing an agreement with the uh, Brown family for Mission Drive, revision to forestry article in the city code, and then under new business, we'll be discussing a striping plan for Edgewood and Stadium and discussion of neighborhood reinvestment and facade program, facade program. Um, and we, we have uh, we receive a planning and protective services monthly report and an engineering capital improvement program update. So, and as I said, that meeting, our next meeting will be this Thursday, July the 18th. And I don't believe we have any liaison or other committee reports today. Okay, any questions from anyone on any of those reports? Moving on, uh, there are no appointments by the mayor this uh, week and uh, presentations from staff consultants and invited guests the uh, city administrators monthly finance report mr. Nicholas thank you mr. president uh, the first item and the happiest item I guess uh, for once is the uh, June we are the June sales tax uh, information uh, Bear in mind that the information we're getting on sales tax, there's a lag, so uh, this would represent economic activity that occurred 30 to up to 90 days ago. Uh, but on the good side, uh, we are now uh, just about exactly on our projection for what we wanted to be for this year, what we thought we would be for this year, not what we wanted to be, but what we thought we would be. You can see we're 0.004% uh, below projections, which is about as close as you can hope to be. Um, now, that is, of course, the revised projections, not uh, what we had originally had hoped for. So we hope that that number is trending upward and that we will continue to receive additional sales tax, um, and that will improve the situation. Again, if you go to the next slide, because it's so close, I did kind of a zoom in. You can see we're really right on our projection. Moving on to the fund balance. Uh, fund balance it remains unchanged. If you uh, saw the report from last, you'd see that the number has changed. 
and that was really just a technical change that we made that made a slight difference but nothing has changed in the fund balance and so it remains the same uh, and still what we consider to be at a healthy fund balance and then I did want to spend a little bit on uh, lodging tax There's a more complex chart this time than what you've seen in the past the dark uh, line uh, should be blue but it's kind of a grayish color uh, that is the current 2013 and you can see that it's trending the lodging tax is trending above where we have seen in the past that is a very good thing uh, it's interesting to see I, I, the reason I put the 2011 2012 we only have partial data on this uh, when you look at the total tax I didn't include the part before when our check tax changed but you can see that uh, from June, we'll say July through December, the lodging tax for the last two years has been nearly identical, following the same trend. So we can assume that it will probably follow that same trend. It's also interesting, you can see very clearly from that, the biggest months for uh, lodging tax collection, collections, which would also indicate the biggest months for people staying in our hotels, uh, is September and October. And then it falls off uh, substantially in November and December. But August is also, which is what we're coming into, apparently a slow month, I guess. People don't see the joy of August in, uh, in mid-Missouri. Uh, the council had asked that we do an additional report, which is uh, showing where the departments are against the budget. We were not able to get that prepared for this report, but we will have that next month. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Are there any questions for Mr. Nicholas? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Uh, that's item 11, announcements by mayor. Well, oh, excuse me, I jumped over one. Item 10, presentations from staff, consultants, and invited guests. And we have an invited, or we, it's not an invited guest, but we have someone signed up to speak. Um, or maybe you are invited, Gloria. I'm not sure. Why don't you come come forward? Gloria Enlow uh, has an update on JCTV. And I don't know if we have to ask you to do name and address, but just in case, would okay, you Okay, well, I'm uh, Gloria Enlow. I'm from JCTV on the campus of Lincoln University, 709 East Dunklin Street. Thank you. And I think I was invited by Carrie, so there you we'll go. call us okay. an invited guest. Well, I want to update you about our fundraiser. It's coming up this Thursday. It's July 18th. Um, we have the Mid-Missouri Hog Wild Talent Show. We're going to be having a whole hog roast and barbecue dinner at the McClung Park Pavilion. And we're also going to have a talent show where we have people from the Mid-Missouri area compete. Um, we have a couple singers, a band, and a cheer group that's going to perform. And we'll have a panel of judges decide who the winner is with some help from the audience reaction. Uh, but the big draw is going to be, of course, the dinner, which is going to be delicious from Michael's Unforgettable Barbecue. Um, what we are doing besides planning for our fundraiser is working on increasing some of our programming. Uh, we've joined something called pigmedia.org. It's a free uh, website and basically it's pig channels from across the country have banded together and they're uploading programming that would be of national or regional interest. So you can share programming on there and also use what they have and we're going to um, talk about uploading some of the stuff we do, uh, the bigger productions, the Christmas parade, capital caroling, and just some things we think would be of national interest. Uh, one of our volunteers, Jeff Bassinson, does a show with us um, called Bass Notes, and he also does the Jazz Fest. He provides us copies of that that we run on the channel. But he's been uploading that onto this um, website, and he's been getting downloads from California, and he's got, I think, 22 states now where that program is being aired. So it gives people from across the country the ability to see what's happening in Jefferson City. Um, and we are really focusing on educational programming right now. We really want to bring that up. And right now, we have about 30% of our playback schedule is dedicated to educational programming. Uh, we have two groups of volunteers that are in training right now. We have four community volunteers that are in one group. They're training to uh, be able to produce a dance show that they're wanting to do at JCTV. And then we have another group of two volunteers, and they're actually Lincoln University students and employees. And they are learning how to do digital editing because they have some video that they want to work on to actually make a show out of and provide it for the channel. And we're really excited because we have two students who have been volunteers at JCTV for a couple of years now. And they graduated, and they are enrolling in Lincoln University in the fall. And they'll be going in the journalism program. So we will have even more uh, access to them, and they'll be able to spend even more time with us. 
um, we would like to uh, work with the city to establish some more government programming like I said we have about 30 percent of our programming is dedicated to educational um, shows but we'd like to do some more government shows right now we do city council and we do planning and zoning but we'd like to maybe get some stuff firmly on the schedule whether it's award ceremonies that take place here uh, additional committee meetings um, or candidate forums we usually do do the candidate forums but I'd like to get them on a calendar so make sure that we can be available for those and we are looking forward to seeing Dr. Rome Monday at 1 o'clock. He's going to be a guest on uh, W.T. Edmondson's show. And so we'll have a chance to introduce him to the facility. Great. Uh, would you, just in case someone that's watching uh, maybe wanted to write those dates down for your fundraiser, would you repeat those dates again, please? Sure. That's Thursday, July 18th. It's going to be from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock at the McClung Park Pavilion. Um, tickets are $20 for adults and $12 for kids, and you can get them in advance or you can pay at the door. And where can you get them? They can email jctvaccess at gmail.com or call us at 681-5443. Okay, why don't you repeat that one more time? All right. The email address is jctvaccess at gmail.com, and the phone number to reach us is 681-5443. Thank you. Any questions for Gloria? Thank you. In listening to all the programming and all that's coming up on JCTV, is there a place the public can go? Is there a website or Facebook page that shows, like you mentioned, 1 o'clock, Kevin Rome will be on on a certain day, and all these new programming uh, tips that you gave us tonight that are going to be shown. How can the public uh, tap into that? Uh, we do have a website. Uh, it's jctvaccess.com, and our schedule's on there, both our production schedule and our playback schedule, so people can not only see when stuff is airing, but when we're going to be doing stuff. Um, and then we also have a Facebook page, and it's just JCTV, and we update that pretty regularly. Sure. And one last thing, and I don't know if Bill Betts might be the one to, to know this. Is there a link to the JCTV access if you go to jeffcitymo.org? Can they link into that? And I, I guess if not, maybe we could add that. I think there we is. do that, yeah. yeah. Great. There is one there, so they can even go to jeffcitymo.org. Thank you, Gloria. Great information. Thanks, Gary. And... I had a question and went completely out of my head. So does anyone else have one while I'm trying to think of it? Mr. Graham. Well, first of all, thank you for your presentation to the council. I know you had mentioned earlier about uh, some of the different uh, events that JCTV is covering. For example, the city council meeting and public works and planning. You mentioned Planning and zoning. Planning and zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know as relates to a part of being transparent, uh, is there any way possible that maybe the finance committee could be uh, could be televised so that uh, the uh, the city of Jefferson can see uh, what's exactly taking place uh, just trying to be more transparent I think we could do that one issue might be where the Finance Committee meets because I don't believe they meet in here and I think they might have something else that's happening in here during that same time okay. but we can look and definitely see if we can get that in here if we can get it in here it'll be very easy if not we could maybe uh, do a one camera shoot um, and just put that on on the air as well okay thank you so very much mm -hmm. are there any other questions for uh, Gloria you know I can't remember my questions so I guess I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure if it's senility or just exactly what it is but anyway I'll have to ask you at another time when it happens like, to occur can, to me again you can email or call us or, or ask me Thursday night <laughs> okay well thank you very much for being here we appreciate the good update thank you thank you okay Moving on, um, we're at number 11, announcements by mayor, council, and staff. And I think there are a couple of council people who have an announcement. Carrie? Thank you. The Jefferson City Kiwanis Club asked that I announce their black and white luau party, which is J July 27th. It's a fundraiser that will benefit four local charities, the Rape and Abuse Crisis Service, American Red Cross, Jefferson City Daycare, and the annual Jeff City Police Department Buddy Pack program. So definitely wanted to make sure since our police department is involved in that, that, that we announce that. If you are interested, it's $50 per ticket, and you can call Holly at 573-680-1712. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Councilman Bray. Yes, uh, Councilman Henry and I are going to host a community meeting for the 5th Ward. It's coming up this Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock. 
and we ask folks in the fifth ward and it's open to the public too uh, community wide we will be discussing uh, projects and issues of interest to the fifth ward and to the community uh, so we, we ask folks to come and attend and bring your ideas and comments and do not bring your checks bo checkbooks this is not a fundraiser <laughs> it's it's we're going to exchange information and ideas that morning that's coming up this saturday nine o'clock to eleven o'clock and it's at uh mcclung park hope to see you there rain or shine rain or shine it's indoors indoors okay very good any other uh, announcements or questions okay we'll move on to the uh, next item uh, which is the consent agenda uh, and the only item on there is the minutes of the City Council meetings for June 27th and did I miss one I yes I did I jumped it again sorry about that number 12 presentations from the gallery on specific bills or resolutions all individuals will be limited to five minutes without exception. All presentations shall be made from the podium unless other accommodation is requested and granted. And the only person who has signed up is Chris Shepherdly regarding Bill 2013-36. Mr. Shepherdly. Hi, Chris Shepherdly, 2203 Oakview Drive. Uh, I'd just like to thank Bob and council and staff. <clears throat> um, like I said, I'm Chris Shepherdly. I'm president of All Seasons Landscaping and Construction Incorporated. <clears throat> I'm a Jeff Jefferson City resident, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about the uh, compost site facility. Um, my business has operated the Jefferson City compost site for the last three years. We've processed large volumes of yard waste and we've produced a high quality compost. We receive over 100 residents per day on average, and we've had numerous compliments on how clean our site is kept. We have over 6,000 square feet of paved area that we put in at our facility. We did this to try to keep our site clean and orderly so, so that it was very nice for the citizens of Jefferson City. In addition to that, we have obtained a DNR permit. We have a stormwater prevention plan. That includes extension, extensive erosion control measures. And we do periodic water quality testing. At this time, I'd like to talk about the RFP that you put forward. And I'd like to point out a few items. Part five, the proposal requirements. <clears throat> Part A, system description, basically required identification to for city residents, volume reports. Part B, site consideration, location and size of the site. Item number two, a privately owned property, appropriately zoned property within the city corporate limits. And that zoning is M2. Site must have easy access, must have a paved entrance and exit, and the contractor must clearly identify the hours of operation. Item C, operation of the drop-off site. Number, under number two, it says at a minimum, the city wishes to continue the same level of service and clearly states the summer hours, the winter hours, and also wants the operator to list the holidays that would be when they would be closed. Item D, advertising. Item E, waste guarantee. Item F, marketing compost. Item G, financial, financing and financial projections. And then that brings us to item H, the evaluation process. But I'd like to go back. These were all proposal requirements. So item H, after determining 
that a proposal satisfies the mandatory requirements stated in the request for proposal, a comparative assessment of the related benefits and deficiencies of the proposal in relationship to a published evaluation criteria shall be made, and it goes on. But I'll repeat, after determining that a proposal satisfy the mandatory requirements stated in the request for proposal. The proposal that we submitted met all the mandatory requirements. The other proposal did not. It was evaluated by the committee and presented to the Public Works and Planning Committee to be the best, propose, best proposal. The committee voted unanimously to send it to the full council. That is where we are today. I take pride in my business and my property and treating others with respect. My employees treat others with respect and they treat all who come to the Jefferson City Compost site with respect. We, we provide a great service to the city and we would like to continue to provide that great service. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Shepherd? Thank you, Chris. Okay, now we will move on to item 13, the consent agenda. Uh, minutes of City Council meeting July 27th and July 1st, 2013. I need I need a motion to approve the so consent agenda. We have a motion. Do we have a second? second? We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please make it known by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. And any opposed? It is unanimous. Motion passes. Uh, there are no bids over fifty thousand, so we move on to fifteen bills introduced. First bill, 2013-38, please read it. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, amending the 2012-2013 budget of the City of Jefferson, Missouri by appropriating additional funds within the wastewater fund. Mr. Marash. Thank you. Uh, as clerk indicated, this is a supplemental to the wastewater uh, fund budget. Uh, it's $50,000 supplemental for chemicals. Uh, all commodity funds uh, must run through the council for them to be uh, appropriated if, if they are to exceed the current budget. Uh, basically, uh, as, I under, as I understand it, we're using a lot more chemicals this year than we have in the past, uh, trying to keep the odors down uh, about our various pump stations and system. Okay. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Marash? Mr. Bray. Matt, do I understand right? This comes out of fund balance, the fifty thousand. This comes out of the wastewater fund balance, so that the wastewater is a separate utility fund. They collect rates uh, and and are kept in a in a separate fund than the general fund. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Marash? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Twenty thirteen thirty nine. An ordinance amending the code of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, regarding the connection fee paid by entities connecting to the sanitary sewer. Mr. Marash. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, another wastewater topic. The, uh, the proposal is to increase the sewer tap fee from uh, its current $300 to $400. This was discussed at, the, at a previous Public Works and Planning Committee meeting and recommended to the Council for approval. Uh, just real quick, a connection fee is really a way for new customers to buy into an existing system. The, the uh, the ratepayers uh, previously had built a system that could expand to allow growth uh, outside of, of the current system. Uh, new, new connections would pay this connection fee. Uh, simple math really indicates that uh, uh, we have an 11 million gallons per day plant. Approximately 30,000 households could connect to that, and that would put the uh, connection fee around $1,000 if, if done in simple math terms. Uh, we uh, felt like the incremental increase of $100 would be uh, palatable to the community and not stifle development. Uh, we checked rates in other neighboring communities. Ashland is uh, over $1,500 for a connection fee. Um, Cape Girardeau, $750. Columbia, $800. A 
Old Summit's 600. So I think we're well within line at the $400 uh, mark, and we'd recommend approval of this. Okay. And it the uh, as the clerk read that she used the term entity. Does that mean both commercial and residential? Anyone who taps in will pay the same fee. Uh, I believe that's true. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, I, I believe it's also there's a water service uh, uh, connection for, charge yeah, as well. For, it's also depending on your water service too. If if you have a multi family this is a unit, residential fee is what I'm. This is a residential fee only. Okay. So a, like a, a multi family unit, say a ten unit condominium for instance, would that be ten times four hundred or is there one four hundred dollar charge? I guess it would depend on if they're ten meters yeah, or not. Yeah, any specifics like that? I'm I'm still new to this. Uh, okay. This area, so I'd have to get back to you on. You those. might you might be able to answer that question yeah. at the next meeting. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Bray. Matt, that's only new construction, right? Yeah, it'd be a new new construction, new tap to the sewer. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Then we'll move on to 2013-40. Uh, An ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute a contract with Hutchins Telecom, LLC, to construct the Route B Tanner Bridge sewer extension. Mr. Marash. Yeah, another wastewater topic. Uh, we have uh, recently bid a project for our new Route B uh, sanitary sewer. It's also a pump station is with that uh, project. The, the cost of this project is uh, $1,121,000, or excuse me, plus $460,000, $65,000 in addition. Um, the, um, this is kind of part of a, an annexation area to the south. It's off of uh, Christie Drive and Route B. And Highway 179 area and serves the Rickman Center that that area if you're familiar with it uh, city staff would recommend approval it's been a project in the works for some time are there any questions for Mr. Mirage Mr. Graham Matt I must ask this question were they the lowest bidder uh, they were and um, I think there are five bidders on this Just project total of five bidders I think there are five bidders okay. this was the lowest thank you sir okay any further questions uh, then we'll move on to 2013-41. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute a contract with Ameren, Missouri Company to provide electrical service to the Route B Tanner Bridge sewer extension. Mr. Mirage. Again, yeah, this is a companion bill to the previous one. Basically, uh, Ameren needs to extend electricity to the site to run the pump station, and, and this would be the cost of that. It's uh, not to exceed $40,000. Okay. Any questions? All right. 2013-42. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an agreement with Evers & Company CPAs LLC for audit services. Mr. Betts. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as the clerk said, this is for uh, our audit services. It's a three-year contract. Uh, staff is proposing that it's with Evers and Company. Um, we had six proposals for this contract. Uh, the staff members that evaluated were Planning and Protective Services Director Janice McMillan, uh, Fire Chief Jason Turner, Chief Accountant Sheila Perry, and myself. Uh, we selected Evers and Company. Their proposal included the first year at 38000 the second year at 39200 and the third year at 40400 uh, for a three-year total of 117600 Evers was not uh, the lowest bidder, but we did feel that they were the best bidder uh, for this particular contract. Um, they were the least expensive on an hourly rate. Uh, Evers did offer to uh, provide more hours of service than the other uh, vendors did, and uh, we felt that their experience was better or at least on par with any of the other uh, folks that made an offer. Okay. I'll answer any are questions. We, are there any questions for Mr. Fetz? Thank you, sir. Yep. 2013-43. An ordinance authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute, execute a grant agreement between the City of Jefferson and the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission for assistance with operating expenses for the air traffic control tower at the Jefferson City Memorial Airport for the period of November 1, 2012 through October 31, 2013. Once again, Mr. Marash. Thank you. The, as the clerk indicated, this is a grant agreement. Uh, the cost uh, is not to exceed $45,000 or the amount we can receive. 
uh, and helps uh, defray the cost of the city's tower at the airport. And this is essentially an annual agreement? Uh, Correct. Comes. And uh, I think it usually comes later than it did this year, but it's always a little behind, but I think we're a little ahead of a little behind this time. Seems like it. <laughs> Are there any questions for Mr. Marash? Thank you. We'll move on to item 16, bills pending. We've already taken up 2013-34 and 2013-35. The clerk will read 2013-36. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an agreement with All Seasons Landscaping and Construction Incorporated for the operation of a public compost site. Okay, thank you. Um, just want to make a quick comment here. Um, this is an issue that uh, came to the Public Works and uh, Planning uh, Committee and was moved forward to the Council. Uh, since that time, there has been a lot of one-on-one -on -one discussion among Council members. Uh, I think there, there has been some concerns about uh, the process, if you will. Uh, also, uh, uh, and when I say process, the, the process for evaluation and so forth. And so I would, uh, would hope that some of our uh, discussion and, and the debate that we've had one-on-one -on -one, uh, among ourselves, uh, uh, that you might be uh, willing to share some of that with uh, the public tonight as we debate this issue and decide whether or not we're going to, uh, uh, to award this contract. So is there uh, debate or comment from any member of the council? Mr. Bray. May I ask a question of staff? Yes, sir. Janice, the, uh, uh, Chris Shepherdly said in his presentation a while ago, the, the, uh, the minimum required questions need to be addressed. I think he said something to that effect. Yes, his, uh, the proposal submitted by All Seasons did meet the minimum requirements, if that's what you're asking. Were there any other bids that also met the minimum there were two proposals one from all seasons and one from break brothers and uh, the contention is that the um, proposal from break brothers did not meet the minimum requirements um, our purchasing director did not s make that suggestion that it didn't meet the minimum requirements but i would like to point out that the differences between the proposals are that All Seasons controls their site and it's properly zoned, <coughs> and that the um, hours of operation uh, specifically were requested to be included in the proposal, uh, that they be at least what is uh, offered today. All right. Thank you. And the, the, the Brake Brothers proposal did not include those same hours and days of operation. Okay, um, Mr. Prather. Uh, I'd be more comfortable in entering in a longer term contract uh, knowing that the process has been more streamlined, uh, the questions being asked in the proposal. The staff did a great job, I thought, but uh, I'd like to see it uh, narrowed down to one option, not three. And uh, I just feel like uh, there was some confusion, and uh, I'd just like to see uh, staff and uh, the committee revisit it. Okay. Any uh, any further comment or questions? Uh, Mr. Mahalovic. I think my comment last time was that consistent with um, a bid being placed and met meeting the qualifications, it is what it is when it's when it's cast. So I, I think the only option is we, we either accept the bid we have before us that has met the requirements or reject all bids and go to a different route would be my uh, my uh, uh, conclusion from that. However, I was a little bit concerned at the increase in the budget that it would take to operate under the option two given. So I would have liked to have more input into trying to maintain a flat level of uh, cost, but uh, maybe at a reduced service because of our budget situation. So uh, I don't know that all those situations were weighed. I know we had a recommendation from staff, which I respect greatly, but um, I, I don't. I don't care for changing location every so often because that adds confusion to the uh, to the uh, 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 citizens who use it. Uh, I use the site. 
Uh, I've used the previous site and I've been quite pleased with the service that the city puts forth, but uh, I, I, I would like to see it flat in terms of budget, whether that meant reduction in services or hours of operation. Um, but having said that, I, I feel like the bid process was fair. The bid process is what it is. Uh, when the bids are closed, they're closed and that uh, we can't reopen things and look backwards uh, the it, it just to me that that would be unfair so I would uh, I'm not gonna uh, my my vote is to either accept the bid or to to do something other than reject all bids or or go forward with something else okay any other mr. Schulte a uh, couple questions for staff um, mrs. McMillan you had mentioned that um, I believe you mentioned that Brake Brothers' proposal did not necessarily meet the requirements of the RFP. Um, I guess my question is, is why did staff not just reject their proposal um, from the beginning but chose to call them and clarify the bid and then go ahead and evaluate their proposal? Um, um, I guess I uh, relied on the opinion of our purchasing director and if she had said that uh, the proposal didn't meet the minimum requirements then we could have rejected that proposal outright um, but given that they submitted a proposal and they submitted uh, cost proposals for all of the options that we requested uh, even though they didn't propose winter hours um, um, it wasn't clear that that was an oversight on their part, but um, we just went ahead and, con and included uh, them in the evaluation um, given those conditions. Um, do you feel like that once you open the door to Brake Brothers to clarify their bid that at that point um, you chose for their bid then at that point to be responsive based upon their clarification and at that point it does meet specification with clarification or, or it still does not meet what's requested in the RFP well um, I guess to me the response wasn't wasn't really all that clear and I assumed that they could could uh, could go either way depending on 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 whatever but um, they did did not follow up with a um, response on the winter hours which I guess hindsight's 2020 you know if, if we were going to allow them to do that we maybe sh we should have requested they follow up with something in writing to confirm that they were were in fact going to include winter hours um, or again maybe we shouldn't have called them to try to figure it out so uh, mr. helper let, let me follow up real quick uh, do you do you feel that the uh, and I know you want to respond to, to councilman Schulte so let me go ahead and let you do that and then I'll follow up go ahead. okay sure uh, I'd go a step further maybe than, than Janice there is a part of the proposal that says you can waive any uh, minor deficiencies uh, if it's to the advantage of the city and I think the, the group decided it was better to have two in the game than one and uh, it, you know maybe I'm just faulting my memory but my recollection of that meeting was that we were looking for the winter hours and called them to determine if the winter hours were there somewhere now maybe that was just me and not somebody else so uh, I, I think uh, the group brought both of them along because we felt it was more advantageous to have two people bidding uh, that was that's where my thought process was on on that issue sure mr. Hilpert in your opinion was the RFP in sufficient detail to specify winter hours or was it is there room for um, a different interpretation I would say it was not uh, uh, clear at all as to winter hours because they just left it blank um, but uh, that's something I, I think we felt could be negotiated and it was want to throw this out because it's not a straight bid it's not apples to apples you know they're proposing a certain type of service and, and all seasons proposed a certain type of service so there is some valuation on, on each side uh, I think certainly if if uh, 
if we moved forward, we would have, I, I don't think we'd have been able to move forward with a, a much, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. I don't think we could have brought Brake Brothers forward without specific uh, either a revision or something in writing about those winter hours. But because the committee voted to move all seasons forward, it didn't seem to me necessary to move to, to get that information uh, uh, in writing from Brake Brothers at the time. We knew that in grading at the RFP was deficient, at least in our minds, in that area. But, uh, you know, that's what we thought, I think, at the time. Okay. Well, you, you actually asked one of the questions that I was going to ask, and that I, I was going to ask uh, you, Ms. McMillan, and, and uh, you as well, Mr. Hilbert. Uh, do you feel that the uh, request for proposal process, which is different than a request for bid process, uh, the and I wish I had the uh, the item numbers in, or letters in front of me, but I don't. But uh, do you do you believe that the um, provision that allows you to waive irregularities and the provision which says uh, essentially that <laughs> the city will negotiate the final contract uh, after selecting a uh, proposer or, or a provider, uh, do you believe that those two provisions being different in a uh, request for proposal permit you to uh, clarify um, if you had have chosen uh, Break Brothers, would that have had allowed you to confirm with them and, and add to their proposal the uh, winter hours? I think that could, would the, the fact that we, if they were chosen by the council, then we would have to still come back with a contract and the contract would have to include those winter hours. And, and if they, if Break Brothers then came back to us and said, no, we wouldn't do that th at the same price, then we'd come back to the council and say we could not come to an agreement with the Break Brothers under the provisions that we believe the council approved and go back to the second proposer. So, so you, just to clarify, you, you do confirm that you believe that those two provisions would allow you to, to make that adjustment to their proposal or to either proposal if, if uh, uh, that was a question. I believe the provisions would allow the council to select them as the successful proposer uh, on the conditions that the, the staff can negotiate a, a reasonable contract that allows at least the same hours as what's provided today. And again, because we didn't select, uh, the staff didn't select that as the, the Brick Brothers as the proposer, it didn't seem necessary at the time to clarify that. Okay. And I have another question, unless someone else, I'll let someone else speak first. Okay. Uh, something that I hadn't considered, I, I have to admit I hadn't read it that carefully, I guess. But uh, one of the things that Mr. Shepherdly pointed out earlier in going through item by item, in the request for proposal he made mention of i believe if i am saying this correctly a paved entrance and perhaps even a paved driveway uh, the property that uh, was proposed by mr Bra or the brake brothers uh, at this time they do not have a lease on that property that is something that they would obtain uh, should they it have been a awarded to them or at least that that was their proposal do you know if any of those necessary improvements are made to that property or would, would that be something that you would have to negotiate and confirm into the, uh, into the agreement? I would assume that um, once Break Brothers had a lease for the property, they would, um, and a contract for the compost site, that they would install the improvements that are um, required in our RFP. Uh, this kind of goes back a little bit to Councilman Mihaljevic's uh, 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 oh, what am I trying to say? His his r reference to the uh, vagueness, uh, and I don't know that he used that term, but uh, of the RFP, or maybe it was even Councilman Prather that was concerned about the RFP itself. Do you have in the RFP, or is there a way, or does it mention any time uh, that a person uh, or a successful proposer would have to provide these site improvements? Is there any way to enforce that, or is that something that would have to uh, 
be met before you would award the contract or would you award the contract with the idea that that they can meet that at some future date mm -hmm. it would be a condition uh, that would be included in the contract it would be something they would have to include um, before they opened the site or within a certain period of time it's a city contract so the city can basically say what it wants as far as the site improvements so that would kind of go back to that provision I was talking about earlier where you negotiate those final wording and final provisions of yes. the contract based on uh, someone that you select okay uh, mr. Hope. it's probably worth noting of course there were three options available and uh, the staff suggested uh, all seasons with option two I think it was but the council if they so chose could go with of course either bidder uh, proposal, but also any option for uh, for uh, either of the options and I'm not totally sure but I think option one of uh, the uh, Janice would no problem option one of the all seasons is maybe not flat but not a huge increase either so yes I that is another thing that has been again uh, included in the one-on-one -on -one discussions that some of us have had uh, is the idea that perhaps the option one might be more preferred uh, because it does have a lower uh, annual rate than does option two would you explain for the council uh, what the two options are option one is um, a service that would allow residents of the city to bring their yard waste to the compost site free of charge um, and it also uh, would allow businesses to bring yard waste in including landscape companies uh, for a fee okay. and then option two um, would allow landscaping is the same for residents allowing residents to bring yard waste in free of charge um, but also allows um, landscape being companies with a business license to bring in uh, landscaping materials or uh, yard waste free of charge uh, but charges out of town um, out of towners for the use of that site would you say option one is most close uh, closely resembles even though it's not exactly the same does it most closely resemble the service that we currently have today well uh, currently uh, we allow landscaping companies that are registered as home occupations to bring in the uh, those materials um, at a uh, free or at a reduced charge um, so option one would start charge I would assume under option one all of the uh, home occupations all of the landscape companies would be charged to bring in yard waste and realistically what is the probability that that is closely or even strictly enforced well you would have to ask mr. Shepherdly because he I would, did he would be the one <laughs> his staff would be the one that would enforce it actually it's, I did, and it's very I, difficult I did I talk to, to him about this today and he he acknowledged that it's a very <laughs> difficult thing and is yes, probably is. not very strictly right. enforced not because they don't try necessarily just because it's very difficult yeah. Ms. Carol thank you a lot of the debate has focused on whether or not the request we got or the information we receive from break brothers is clear or not and really what we what's important is what the city presented in our RFP was clear we asked for very specific things in that RFP hours and different criteria so we were completely clear now we have something that came back to us that's vague I know Janice mentioned in high hindsight we might do things different and ask them different questions well I don't think there's any doubt we shouldn't feel doubtful we shouldn't feel like maybe we should have asked this or that when they're any company submitting us a bid this is their time to shine this is their time to show us what they have to offer to us if they left something out that big and that important whether it was a mistake and oversight we need to take that into consideration and say the caliber of company we want to run our compost site should read through that very clearly look at the RFP and make sure they have included it maybe double check it a few times and make sure they're submitting us something that's absolutely clear so mm -hmm. it's not really our problem to guess and debate whether it was left in or out on purpose or not and follow up I I think that was nice that staff did give them the benefit of the doubt and, and go a little extra mile and, and try 
but I think there are other factors, even in addition to the hours, that do make Chris uh, Shepherdly's um, <clears throat> proposal better, including owning the site and, and several other reasons as well. But I, I think that's their time. If something's left out, it all, it kind of reflects a little bit on the company, and that also influences my decision. I want somebody to look at that RFP and answer it correctly. Thank you. Okay. Any any other comments or questions? Mr. Shelton. Thank you. Um, Mrs. McMillan, what is the difference between our current contract um, with all seasons and option number two of all seasons? Currently, our annual fee is 212, is it the cost? Right. 212,000 is our current uh, contract amount annual. And year one of uh, uh, option two, I believe was 200 and 36,000 that's correct okay so $24,000 difference correct how how is that accounted for in the upcoming budget well there is an amount included in uh, contact contractual services um, I believe it's a uh, at the current rate so we would have to find find additional funds that are in the budget or have the council allocate additional amount to cover that difference okay and just for clarification, option one is 212000 as well. It is. is. That correct? For the first year, that's correct. And I believe each year there's a $3,000 increase yes. over the life of the agreement. Correct. Mr. One more question. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there a performance bond included, Mr. Hilpert, with the bid? Yes. Okay. I think, uh, well, there's a bid bond, no. Yes. Any additional comments or questions? Mr. Schultz. Um, after hearing all the debate and, and listening to both proposers, uh, Mr. Uh, Brake presented at the last council meeting, Mr. Shepherdly presented at this meeting. I think we've all the council has received correspondence from, from both. Um, But being in the, the business that I am and, and having to bid on projects, there's many, many times I wish I could go back and have a redo. Um, and I don't think that's the way the process works or should work. Um, and therefore, I would, I would like to make a motion uh, and in consideration of the budget um, and where we're at, I'd like to make a motion that we except option number one of all seasons proposal in lieu of option number two that's currently in the bill uh, at the two hundred and twelve thousand dollars and that would maintain the current level of service that we have now today okay we have a motion is there a I'll second, second that. we have a motion and a second okay uh, so this motion would substitute option one for option two in the current bill is that correct that's what your intent okay is there any debate Mr. and could Gray. you please read option one one more time for the record sure miss mcmillan do you have that um option one um uh, year one is two hundred and twelve thousand uh, dollars total for all five years um would be one thousand one million ninety dollars and and it I believe there's a or maybe you don't have it right there in front of you but I believe there's verbiage that indicates that all residents will receive their service free and businesses will have be to charged pay, will and be out charged. of town right yes and uh, yeah if you're if you live in the city you and you're a resident of the city you your service is at no charge that's correct is that satisfactory mr. Graham okay uh, Mr. Hussey. I just have a question for Ms. McMillan. This is a five-year contract, but it's annually renewable, correct? Yes. So it does that come before the council on an annual basis to renew? It does. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Mahalovic, I think that you had indicated some desire to uh, discuss uh, perhaps some uh, 
perhaps reduce services or something. I think, would you be satisfied with the idea that we could discuss that during the upcoming year? And then if it's, if it is uh, something that the council would decide, perhaps we could uh, seek an amendment or something at, at some uh, future date, future renewal date. Would that, would that work for you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any further debate or questions? Mm -hmm. Are we ready to vote on the motion? What I will do uh, is, no, I won't have to either. If we vote on this, this will this will be the ordinance that will pass. So any questions? Everybody clear on what we're voting on? Roll call, please. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, it's, it's really a motion to amend the yeah, Okay, we, yes, uh, it is an motion to amend the so ordinance. Do we need roll call for that? Uh, you, you don't on a procedural motion. Okay. Well, in that case, all in favor of uh, the motion to substitute uh, option one for option two, please make it known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It motion passes. Okay, then. Uh, do we need to read it? Have we read it yet? Okay, we've already read it. So uh, we will vote on, unless there's debate, we'll vote on the motion as amended. Roll call, please. Carol? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Mihalovich? Aye. Prather? Aye. Schulte? Aye. Scrivener? Aye. Branch? Aye. Bray? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Um, congratulations, Mr. Shepherd. The uh, Next item of a business is where am I anyway? Okay, 2013-37. An ordinance amending Chapter 7, Boards and Commissions of the Code of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, by renaming the Mid-Missouri Property Assessed Clean Energy Development Board to the Missouri Clean Energy District. Uh, Mr. Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Again, this is a, uh, a board that we created, and uh, it has been, although did not meet, uh, has not been very successful in its original purpose, which we'd hoped it would do a lot for residential uh, energy savings. Uh, the board actually has been very successful and has spread statewide, and uh, it really is fairly independent of us. We don't fund it. Uh, we have a, a representative on the board, but that's about it. Uh, but it exists through our ordinances. Therefore, they would like to change their name, and in order to change their name, the City Council of Jefferson City has to approve that. So this would be changing the name of that board. Okay. Are there any questions uh, for Mr. Nicholas in regard to this bill? Ready to vote? Roll call, please. Graham? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Mihalovich? Aye. Prather? Aye. Schulte? Aye. Scrivener? Aye. Branch? Aye. Bray? Aye. Carroll? Aye. Okay, the, the bill passes. Uh, there is nothing on the informal calendar. Uh, number 18 resolutions, RS 2013 20. A resolution authorizing the City of Jefferson, Missouri to apply for an historic preservation fund grant. Ms. McMillan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we have an opportunity to apply for a Historic Preservation Fund grant uh, offered through the State Historic Preservation Office of Missouri Department of Natural Resources uh, for the purpose of sending a staff member to the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions next year. Uh, their annual biannual meeting is in July uh, 2014. This grant would pay for the travel expenses of this one staff member and it's a reimbursable type of a grant. Uh, in that 60% uh, of the total cost would be um, returned to the city, but the match is actually provided by the staff time. So um, we would ask your approval so this could be, so we could file this application. Uh, we would come back to the council if we actually are selected uh, to receive the grant for the final approval. Okay. Any questions for Ms. McMillan? Okay, uh, is this a motion? motion? Roll call, we please. Need motion. Oh, I'm sorry, we need a motion first, don't we? Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. 
And we have a motion and a second. Now we'll have a uh, roll call vote. Hussey? Aye. Mahalovich? Aye. Prather? Aye. Schulte? Aye. Scrivener? Aye. Branch? Aye. Bray? Aye. Carroll? Aye. Graham? Aye. Okay, the resolution passes. Um, item 19, presentations from the gallery on other topics. All individuals will be limited to three minutes without exception. All presentations shall be made from the podium unless other accommodation is requested and granted. We only have two individuals who have signed up, and the first one on the list is Jennifer Turgeon. Welcome, Hello. and Thank uh, please you. state your name and address for the record. Jennifer Turgeon, 123 East High Street Rear in Jefferson City. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. With feral cats, a hot topic right now, I thought this would be a good time to talk about my organization, Wild Things Feral Feline Fix. We are a trap neuter return group here in Jefferson City, which means we set live traps to trap feral or wild cats. Um, we have them spayed and neutered, a rabies vaccination, and then we re-release them where we trapped them from, whether it be their colony or their yard or wherever they're, wherever they're living at. Um, there's been a lot of discussion lately about what happens with feral cats when they're taken to the animal shelter. And being a compassionate person and a cat lover, of course, nobody likes to see an animal destroyed just for being. I mean, these cats aren't necessarily doing anything wrong. They're just not adoptable pets. Um, there's, there's not a lot of options. You can allow the cats to just continue to breed and go about their business. You can attempt to find barn homes for the cats but I can tell you there are many, many more cats than there are available barn homes. Um, we can continue to do what's happening now where the cats are put down, or the option I prefer is the trap, neuter, return. Um, we have been doing this since January of 2010, and today, actually, we spayed and neutered our 415th cat. So I would like to think we're making an impact in the city on the feral cat population. Um, there are only two of us doing this, two people, two dedicated volunteers, and a very limited budget. So we rely a lot on donations from the people who are feeding the cats or caring for these cat colonies. Um, the Heart of Missouri Humane Society does support us also with our funding. I just wanted to kind of put a bug in your ear and let you know that um, I'm sure you've heard a lot from residents in the community recently about about cats and wildlife in general but um, there are over a thousand communities throughout the United States that are currently and actively pra practicing TNR and it it really really cuts down on the population of the cats um, once a colony is no longer breeding then the cats naturally die off you know two to five years is an average lifespan for a feral cat and the problem really kind of takes care of itself in a more compassionate manner than how it's currently being handled so I just wanted to uh, maybe let the council consider possibly Jefferson City having an actual city operated TNR program through animal control I don't know if that's an option but um, I think that it's something that would make a lot of animal lovers and a lot of people in the community happy to see the cats being treated in a more compassionate manner. The ones, the ones that are welcome, the ones that aren't hurting anything. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's it. Thank, thank you very much. We appreciate the presentation. And we, are there any questions, uh, Mr. Prather? I appreciate what you're doing. It's it's very humane, and uh, I, I was kind of curious as how much does it cost per animal to. <coughs> It depends. It depends on who will work with us. Um, we currently have two local veterinarians that are doing all of our surgeries for us, and on average, we pay fifty dollars per cat, and that's for the surgery and for the rabies vaccination. Okay, Ms. Carroll. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, do you know on the the number? I believe you said about a thousand other communities offer this same program. Are they mostly volunteer efforts, or do you know if they're done through their city? there's actually a, a wide variety there um, there are some animal control facilities who will take in the feral cats only they are then signed over to a not-for-profit group similar to ours 
so the city isn't the one actually the municipality is the one actually doing the service um, it, it's transferred over to a non for profit there are some communities um, Spartansburg North Carolina is actually a popular one right now that received a grant through their animal control and they are actually sending their animal control officers out on a daily basis doing the TNR themselves so it's 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 workable I mean it could be something that the city does itself it could be something that the city supports through an organization like wild things thank you um, I know the city has a group and I forget what it's called there's an animal shelter advisory committee I believe that's the name of it it's made up of maybe three veterinarians mm -hmm. it's a small group and I think they meet on an ad needed base as needed basis but this might be an appropriate topic for one of their future meetings if you could talk with them and perhaps they could um, tap into the need and the uh, resources that might be available in the community that could form a nonprofit that would it would end up benefiting the city in the long run because those animals aren't ending up in our shelter right to be cared for or euthanized or whatever the case may be but this might be something that they could um, address and I don't know when they meet or who the staff liaison is but perhaps that person could put you in touch with with that committee thank you any anyone on this side thank you very much for coming thank you for having me okay and the next person on the list is uh, Jackie Fisher welcome please state your name and address for the record hi um, minutes, I'm Jackie Fisher I live at 2207 Merlin Drive um, I am here <coughs> mainly for the I am president of the friends of the Jeff City Animal Shelter and um, I feel like we need to make uh, give you an update on what we are doing um, we've been asked a lot of questions on you know why are we still raising money you know we have a new this new shelter what's going on what are you using the money for um, and that leads me to our uh, mission statement and that is to rescue, nurture, and adopt as many dogs and cats as possible into forever loving homes, to promote the health and well-being of companion animals, to educate pet owners on the importance of spaying, neutering, and regular vet care, to encourage pet ownership as a lifetime commitment, and to share the joy that our pets offer. Um, since our inception in 2007, we have worked relentlessly towards our mission. We began by realizing the need for a larger, safer, and more accommodating animal shelter. Our volunteers raised $225,000 for the new building, which opened in June of 2012. This new facility is well equipped to assist the animals and the staff. It's beautiful, which increases the number of visitors and encourages adoptions. Distinct areas for the animals increase their comfort and their health while they await their forever home. We are currently hard at work landscaping the new building. We started by building a courtyard, which holds the memorial pavers our supporters have purchased. Then we had irrigation and sprinklers installed. Our volunteers, along with the Bittersweet Garden Club, have worked tirelessly digging and more digging, <laughs> planting and mulching and spreading rock, and the finished proj project will be such a beautiful inviting for years to come. Um, we continue to assist the animal shelter by purchasing enrichment items for the animals. The friends pay for collars for every cat and dog, and that is to encourage, encourage their new owners to keep identification on their pets, which is extremely important. We have purchased cat dens for the more timid cats, giving them the ability to hide in their kennels lowers their stress level and improves their health. This allows visitors, uh, we have provided dog dishes for the dogs which hang outside their kennels, which allows visitors to hand feed the dogs, encouraging socialization and good behavior. We are currently researching a sound system to play soothing uh, continuous music to put the animals at ease during their stay. We are now focusing on spaying, neutering, and promoting veterinary care with our low cost spay and neuter program. We are selling 120 vouchers this year for the low price of 20 bucks. This voucher allows the holder to take their pet to one of 12 local vets for spay or neuter, and the friends pick up the bill for them. This, the decreased number of breeding pets will also de decrease the number of animals needing homes. When someone learns that you're a part of the friends group, 
they tend to come to you with, with questions relating to the animal shelter. Sometimes we can answer those questions and sometimes we give uh, suggestions, but we don't have all the answers as we are not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the animal shelter. The friends do not work for the shelter, we work with the shelter. We share the common goal of bettering the lives of the pets in our community. The shelter employees do not have access to spend our funds, and we do not fund the day-to-day -day operations at the shelter. When a suggestion or request is made, whether by a volunteer or shelter employee, it is voted on by our board. Due to the generosity of our animal loving community, we have been able to make a big difference in the shelter animals and for other pets in the community. We hope this benevolent partnership continues to thrive from year for years to come. Thank you very much. Thank There's you. no question that you have been a big part in helping the uh, uh, new shelter to become a reality. Uh, I know you've, you've worked for years to help uh, raise funds and, and yes. support the shelter. and. Uh, uh, I think sometimes we're amazed by uh, how much the budget is to uh, to c take care of, of abandoned and, and uh, uh, animals. Uh, yes. I, I don't know if you're aware or not, but I think the city budget's about three quarters of a million dollars to operate the shelter, and, yeah. and certainly the impact that you have with the uh, fundraising and the support and the, and the money that that you're able to raise and spend, mm -hmm. it's, it's very significant yes. in the operation. And, and certainly, I want to thank you uh, as an individual, but also uh, as a representative of the council. Yes. We thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, is there any other comments or questions? Mr. Mahalovic. A couple. Well, um, I was unaware uh, that it was that amount, a quarter million dollars, or mm -hmm. 225, is that what you mm -hmm. said? Well, 225, that, yes. Uh, that is impressive. Um, also, could you reread your mission statement? Yes. You please. Uh, our mission is to rescue, nurture, and adopt as many animals, as many dogs and cats as possible into forever loving homes, to promote the health and well being of companion animals, to educate pet owners on the importance of spaying, neutering, and regular veterinary care, to encourage pet ownership as a lifetime commitment, and to share the joy that our pets offer. I think that's terrific, and I and I uh, I also heard you say that uh, our shelter shares those goals. Yes. Whether it be, I don't know if it's written or not, but uh, and I'd hope that we would uh, be measuring those goals and being able to 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 meet those uh, those uh, mission statement as you described it yes. and the goals that we have. Yes. Um, are you? Have you? Did you go to the advisory committee today? Yes, I did. Okay. Were you given some time to speak? No, okay. we weren't, no. Uh, I would hope that also with that kind of a commitment dollar-wise that we, we can accept your input in some fashion, whether it be advisory or otherwise, right? and that you continue to guide uh, and assist us in, mm -hmm. in, in uh, yes. mutual goals. Um, as of right now, um, the adoption rate for the adoptable animals at our shelter is at 100%, and that's, that's pretty darn good. It's very good <laughs> for our shelter, and that's adoptable animals. Are there any other questions or comments? And we thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Okay, uh, council and staff discussion of presentation topics. Is there any further uh, comments or discussion? If not, we'll move on to uh, new business. Is there any new business to discuss? Uh, unfinished business. Uh, Mr. Mahalvey. Um, I was uh, pleased to find that on the website we have uh, some conference center update, and I'd uh, ask for a quick update on the conference center. I can do that. I had an important week, I think, last week. Uh, <coughs> the facilitator was down, and Mr. Johnson met at three uh, quite productive meetings, I think. The first was a, half, a couple hours, half-day work session with uh, the Farmer Brothers. Uh, where he drilled down on their proposals, uh, got a little bit further, understands their uh, position and their proposal better. Uh, he's asked them for yet even more information, and they're working on that. Uh, the next day, they met with the Earhart group, and uh, the same is true for the Earharts. That we, uh, he spent considerable time drilling down on their proposal, uh, getting a better idea what their financing is, and, and sent them home with a lot of homework too. 
Uh, they're going to be corresponding with each other over the next couple of weeks. And another really, really productive meeting, I think, was he held a, a, a forum with uh, uh, the people who were charged with planning the events for their for their organizations. I think we had what maybe uh, ten people there, Nathan, if I recall correctly, uh, somewhere around there. And the more we invited, some sent some co some folks in and some comments by email. And the real value of that is those are the people who are using the conference center. So uh, we uh, got what they expect from them with, uh, you know, some a uh, little bit of surprising results on some of the things they wanted and didn't want. And I wouldn't spoil that. I'd let him <laughs> share that with you when, he, when he's ready. Uh, I, I think he's planning to really get down to the blast tax with the two developers over the next couple of weeks and, and be able to commit to you uh, sometime in August where he thinks their proposals are. And, uh, of course, uh, there will also be some other studies that he'll be doing uh, soon that will assist the uh, assist the uh, producer. so it's kind of an update on a productive week that he keeps working on. Okay, very good. Any questions for Mr. Helpert? Any questions for Mr. Helpert? Thank you, Mr. Helpert. Um, we are coming to item 23, which is um, go into closed session pursuant to section 610.021 dot o two one of the revised statutes of Missouri. The council will go into closed session to discuss the following legal actions section six one oh dot o two one dot one. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? We have a motion, is there a second? We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor of go into closed session, please make known is it roll call? It is roll call. Please roll call. Branch. Aye. Bray. Aye. Carol? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Mihalovich? Aye. Prather? Aye. Schulte? Aye. Scrivener? Aye. We will adjourn across the hall. <laughs>